Greetings, I'm Pat Bauer. I'm Dave Geister. And together we did a book called B is for Battle Cry, A Civil War Alphabet. That is my one and only book. However, my dear husband has... Well, I've got about 20 or 22 books, but I must say, while I've been busy at home making books, my dear wife was teaching for 30... Eight years. 38 years. Yes. She's my hero. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Well, since we can't be with you today, we thought we would invite you into our home. And at some point, we'll take you into Pat's writing room, and we'll take you upstairs to my studio, and both of us will give you just a little taste of what it is we do and how we do it. But uh, we didn't start out this way. We started out as kids, basically just like you. Mm -hmm. In Wisconsin, though, not in Minnesota. That's right. We both loved to read from a very early age. Absolutely, library was my favorite place to go. It still is. One of uh, my favorite genre of books is historical fiction. And this book called Across Five Aprils was one that really got me interested in, in the Civil War. And it's interesting that eventually I became the author of a book about the Civil War. Seems perfect somehow. Mm -hmm. And this little book right here was kind of a life changer for me. My grandmother read this book to me when I was a little kid. It's about the Battle of Gettysburg, the biggest battle of the Civil War. I've been drawing and painting images that I learned about in this book my whole life. Show them the inside picture. And his grandma got this at a garage sale for about a nickel. The end paper here drove me wild. Like I said, I've been drawing this stuff my whole life now. This is a book that I wrote called B is for Battle Cry, A Civil War Alphabet, and it was illustrated by my dear husband, David Geister. Often uh, authors and illustrators never even meet. So this was kind of an unusual project in that we were able to work on it together, which was wonderful because we enjoyed working together. You've probably seen other books like this, Sleeping Bear Press does, a number of them, and they have kind of a, a formula that you, they follow. And if I open it up to Fort Sumter, you'll see that there's a poem here that has four lines, and then there's text that explains about it. And it took a lot of research to do this, and on top of that, it had to fit into a small space. So I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and then I discovered that I had written way too much. And so I had to really close it up. <laughs> really had to, really had to um, do a lot of editing. And I'm sure you do that when you are doing some of your writing. When I wrote this, I decided that I really wanted to put it to music because I'm also a musician. And I decided that a song that was very popular during the Civil War called Hard Times Come Again No More by a man named Stephen Foster would be the perfect, the perfect tune to set the words to. So I'm gonna sing just a little bit of it for you. saying a parody of this and I you probably know what a parody is where the words of the song are changed usually often to make it funnier and in this case I'll just sing it I think like this the soldiers sang a song about their hard tack or hard crackers and it went like this 
Let us pause our game of poker, take our tin cups in hand, while we gather round the fruit cook tent's door, where dried mummies of hard crackers are given to each man. Oh, hard crackers, come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the hungry. Hard crackers, hard crackers, come again no more. Many days you have lingered upon our stomach sore. Oh, hard crackers, come again no more. Well, what I did then, and I'll use Abraham, A is for Abraham Lincoln as an example. I set the words that I wrote and so that means I had to really work at fitting them into the rhyming scheme that would work and uh, uh, the syllables that were available for me to use from that song. A is for Abraham Lincoln. He was called Honest Abe, the rail splitter too, but through the years he became so much more. The boy who loved to read became the president who led our country through the Civil War. So my husband then took my words, and he does this with other books as well when other authors write, and he had to figure out what picture would be perfect, or as perfect as possible, to go with the words that were in the book. Oh, welcome to my studio. As you can see, we've got skulls and vampires and dinosaurs and zeppelins and Union Army officers, a large painting of Fort Snelling, lots of books and props, and Frankenstein's head. Huh, okay. Oh, yes. And this large Civil War painting I'm working on. What a surprise, eh? This particular scene shows soldiers from Minnesota fighting at the Battle of Gettysburg. And remember how I talked a bit about that book that my grandmother read to me when I was a kid? I wasn't kidding. Those stories have settled down deep, deep inside me. So whether I'm doing a large battle scene or paintings for books, like B is for Battle Cry, the process is the same. It almost always starts with little sketches in a small sketchbook like this. These are called thumbnail sketches. Now, they're obviously bigger than my thumbnail, but you get the idea. Let's look at Ennis for Nurses. There's the idea, a nurse bending over and helping a wounded man. My wife and I get into costume, and we pose out in the front yard one day, and somebody shoots a lot of photographs. And I use those photographs to give me the ideas and the inspiration for the painting that ultimately ends up in the book under Ennis for Nurses. There are so many ways to be creative, and one of those is writing. And there are so many topics you can write about. Uh, some people, even very, very young people, have ideas in their heads for writing a novel. I know when I was young, I didn't. I did write one later, however. But a less intimidating thing to do sometimes is to write something short, like a poem. And you might think, hmm, what would I write a poem about? You can write a poem about virtually anything. And I'm going to give you some examples here. The other day, my grandchildren were over and we were making jelly. And it occurred to me that I'd like to write a poem about making jelly with my grandchildren. But then I thought, hmm, I'm going to change the point of view and I'm going to write it as though I were one of my grandchildren's poem is called Making Jelly with Grandma. Do poems have to rhyme? No. Nope. Hmm. Hmm. Well, this one ended up rhyming, and I don't always do that, but it seemed to work best for this. So here's what I came up with. 
elderberry, wild plum, cherry, grape. Grandma, which kind of jelly should we make? They're also very tasty, spread on homemade bread. My grandma's answer was the best. We'll make them all, she said. But then I have another version of that where I changed and added a sister in there. My sister says cherry, but I want plum. Grandma, can I lick the spoon when we're done? Because that's of course what my grandchildren want to do. So I just took something simple like making jelly and you could do one about kicking your soccer ball or you could go out in nature and perhaps you would see a bird or an animal or a cloud or a tree. I happened to look out my back window the other day and a streak of yellow went flying. I scared it. I wish I hadn't because I knew that it was the first goldfinch that I had seen this spring. And here's what I ended up writing. I frightened it from the feeder, the streak of yellow lifting on the wind but that glimpse was just enough to shout, it's spring. And if you take a look at this, you can see that I did a lot of crossing out. I had a number of ideas at first, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the term sloppy copy. Well, I've got a lot of sloppy copies in this notebook. I don't know about you, but I had a lot of younger brothers and sisters. I had seven younger brothers and sisters, and the idea of being in our little tiny two-bedroom house with all of us trying to do school at home, um, I, it would have been difficult, even though my mother was a saint. Well, you may have a little brother or sister, or an older brother and sister, who might be driving you crazy, and rather than yell at them or, heaven forbid, hit them, you might just take up a pen and pencil or pencil and a piece of paper and you could write something instead. My brother is driving me crazy. He won't leave me alone. I want to play my monster game, but instead he's driving me insane. Please leave me alone. My brother is driving me nuts. He's such a little pest. I sculpted a monkey out of clay. He squished it the very next day. Then he hugs me and says, I'm the best. Now, with this poem, you've got some repetition going on. My brother, my brother's driving me crazy. Um, he won't leave me alone. In the first stanza there, I ended it with, please leave me alone, basically restating, he won't leave me alone. In the second stanza, I kind of like happy endings. And so that's why I said, then he hugs me and says I'm the best. But I didn't have to do that. I could have just ended it with the same um, line as the second one, which is, he's such a little pest. So just something to think about because you can put your feelings into a poem, not just describing things that you're doing or objects or whatever, but um, get your feelings into it. Another thing that you could do is make a list of things, for instance, uh, things that I miss. Okay, you could just jot down things like that because this is a difficult time. You're away from friends and often family and uh, your teachers and your school and your favorite restaurants. Okay, so you could make a list of things that you miss. Or if you want, you could twist it around and make it a little bit more positive, which is what I really like to do. And you could make a list of things that starts with, when this is over, I will, I just jotted a couple things down. Jump for joy, make a fort with my friends, get to go to school again, play soccer or baseball or lacrosse or tennis or whatever sport it is that you like to do. Go to blank whatever your favorite restaurant is. Um, visit friends, see your grandparents. Um, with me, play music with my friends. That's one thing that I'm really missing. And, uh, and not seeing all of my grandchildren, my one daughter and grandchildren, and uh, going to museums, all those kinds of things that 
we often like to do, but right now we're home, but we're making the best of it. Now, you could make a list of things that you might possibly write a poem about and then keep that list handy. I know I've got one in here, but I've got so many different things right now. And, um, oops, let me see here once. There we go. Things like you could write about the crescent moon. You could write about your dad's pancakes, your dog or your cat. I know I'm going to be writing a poem here shortly about my ancient wiener dog. He is ancient. And uh, you could write a skateboarding, biking, kicking, a soccer ball, um, a song. Your little brother driving you crazy, like I said. Missing people. Why do you miss them? There are just so many different things that you can do. Some of you have maybe heard of an acrostic. And I made an acrostic poem for my front door, for our front door. Because in our neighborhood, people have been putting things on their front doors. So then when you go for a walk, you can walk by and, uh, and see some of these different things. And last week it was uh, encouraging words is, was the topic. And so I took the word spring and wrote it down vertically, and then I made a word that was encouraging out of each of the letters. And you can try doing that with names, favorite foods, um, but you want to try to relate it to the word that you have going vertically. So these are just some of the things that you can do to be creative. And putting, again, pencil or pen on paper, um, some of you maybe prefer to use the keyboard. I like writing my rough drafts at least down by hand, but I'm considerably older than you are. And uh, I really suggest that you try doing some of these things. I think you'll surprise yourself. It will be a great way to keep track of what's happening in this very interesting time in our world. And someday you can go back and, and look at that and it will be a reminder of what we've, what's been happening here. And I think that would be a really good thing to have. And your teachers will be very impressed if you show them. Have fun writing. I think it's time to start drawing, don't you? I thought so. I'm going to use this right here, a charcoal pencil. I bet you are going to have one of these. These are just fine. I use these my whole life. I'm going to draw my picture on this larger sheet of paper. I suggest you draw yours on one of these probably have something like this around the house. And you know, when I was your age, I would often draw on one of these folders. Why, you might ask? Well, I grew up in kind of a poor family. Luckily, my grandmother worked at a paper factory and they made folders. She brought home boxes of these things that were rejects. They became my drawing paper. So you can use just about anything. All right, now what are we gonna draw? Well, I'm a history guy. You know, one of the books I worked on years ago was called The Voyageur's Paddle. It has to do with the fur trade. Here's a copy of it. Now, of course, this says, and I don't speak French, so forgive me if I get it incorrect, but it's, I believe it's La Rame du Voyageur, which means the Voyageur's Paddle in French. And this is a copy of my book that is sold up in Canada. But we're going to do one of the canoes that you see in my book, okay? And to make it even easier for me, at least, I've got a small version of the real thing. Right here. How cool is that, huh? Now, these were made out of birch bark. You see the lines in there? That lets us know this is birch bark. So our canoe is going to be a smaller squatter version of this with a single person paddling it. Okay, you know how to paddle, right? You take the paddle in your hand like so, and you go like this. This is a little small for me, 
But you get the idea. Look at the shape of the paddle, all right? You wouldn't get very far with a paddle this size, I've got to warn you. Are you ready? Let's get started. Here we go. Pencil, paper. There's one more, perhaps even two more tools that I need you to use. Of course, you need to use your eyes so you can see what you're doing. You also need to use your imagination. We need to combine all these. Let's see what we can do. Ooh, I just thought of something. What if I make a mistake? Do you worry about that? I do. But really, does it have to be perfect? Does everything have to be perfect? No way. Thank goodness. You know what? Let's just have fun and use our creativity. Okay, here we go. You look at your piece of paper. Let's come halfway down and then let's go halfway down from that. So right about here is where the water is going to be. And we're going to make a gentle curving, undulating kind of surface to the water. We do not want our voyageur to have to fight against big, strong waves. Now the back of the canoe is going to be right here, like so. See how it is a curve that goes down and then it stops when it hits the water? Let's do the front the same way. And then it stops. Let's connect them. We're going to do this. Like so. The back of the canoe, the front of the canoe. While we're on this canoe, let's give it a little bit of detail. There should be a line that goes right here. We're creating the illusion of a strip of wood that is held in place with vines and thin strips of bark. That helps the canoe hold its shape. The front of the canoe and the back of the canoe need to have these very special shapes. Watch. Can you see what letter of the alphabet they look like? I'm seeing V's and W's. These are the stitches that help hold the canoe together at the front and the back. Oftentimes, they're covered over with a substance that's kind of like tar. And all that means is we just kind of scribble in here with our pencil to darken those V shapes. There we go. We need to put a few marks on the canoe to make it look more like birch bark. Little tick marks. Like so. And I like to put, as you oftentimes would see in the past, a painted device, a circle or a symbol on the front of the canoe. Mine's going to be a circle. And I think I'm going to put a star in the middle of my circle. Like that. And then I'll just make that outer ring a little bit darker. A few more lines to make it look like birch bark. I like to put a little dark squiggly line under here to look like a shadow. And stop when I get down here. So our canoe's almost done, but we're missing something. What are we missing? We need a voyageur. 
Let's start like this. Here's the back, the shoulder, the chest, and a little bit of the belly. Our voyageur is pointing that way. Let's put a head up here, and the head is a circle, but the bottom front of it is slightly longer, kind of like an egg shape. Watch. Like that, more or less. You gotta have a neck. All right. Mr. Geister, I'm noticing that you are doing some pretty light lines there. Why are you doing that? When I draw, I usually don't make one continuous line. I do lots of fine little lines. It's easier to control where I'm going. When I have the shape of the line figured out, then I can come back and darken it by joining it together. Does that make sense? It's easy to draw that way. Press lightly at first and then darken it up later. I hate erasing, I really do. Before we work on the face, let's get the arms, the hands, and the paddle in place, okay? So the arm is kind of like the letter L. We're just drawing right over top of our canoe. In the end, you won't even notice it. L, L, or Vs that are tipped on their side. And then we put a blob down here to represent the hand. See that? Does it look like a hand now? Kind of a blob with a few bumps on it. That's all we're drawing. Here's the other one. Blob at the end, and this is where the arm's gonna go. But before we go any farther, let's put a paddle between the hands and into the water. And here's a little bit of splash for where it hits the water. All right. Should we work on the face? Let's do it. Now, before we go any farther, I wanna show you a trick. There's the shape of the head. Here's the neck. Let's come halfway down from the top of the head to the chin, halfway, and make a mark. Let me know when you get halfway down. Right about there? Okay. This is where the eye is going to go. Let's go halfway down from the eye to the chin and stop. Halfway there? About right? Okay. That's the underside of the nose right here. Nostril. There's our nose. Let's go halfway down from the bottom of the nose to the chin, and that gives us the mouth. Like so. And then a lip, and the chin sticks out a little bit, and the jaw comes back. And then we can make a little bit of a cheek. I have lines on the sides of my mouth, so I like to do this with my characters. And of course, I have these big eyebrows. Okay, how about this? You gotta put in an ear. We come back from the nose and make a mark there. We come back from the eye, make a mark there, turn it into the letter C. There's your ear. I think ears look kind of like macaroni stuck on the side of the head. Something like that. That's one way to draw a head from the side. Let's see if I can do it really small. Halfway down from the top to the bottom is the eye. 
like a letter V tipped on its side. Halfway down from that eye to the chin is the bottom of the nose. Halfway down again gives us the mouth. And there's the chin. And now we just join them all together. Nose, upper lip, chin, eyebrow, cheek, line, and the ear. Come back from the nose and make a mark. Come back from the eye, make a mark. There we go. And put the little squiggly lines inside. How about some hair? This poor guy's missing the hair on the top of his head. Let's give him a hat to cover up his bald spot. That's what they call a toque. The voyageurs would wear them. They're a knit cap, kind of like an elf hat or a Santa Claus hat. Let's give him a collar on his shirt. Let's give him a couple wrinkles where the fabric comes together like this. You get wrinkles. See that? Those are the details that are going to drive your family and friends crazy. They're going to love it. What about the fingers? Well, look. Count the lines. One, two, three. There are three lines. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Three lines in the middle give us four fingers. And there's a little thumb. We didn't even have to worry about it on this hand because we're seeing the back of it. I'm just going to make the knuckles. And now we get to do the fun part for me. That's the shading. Check this out. Let's make it look like the arm on the other side of the body is really on the other side of the body. Let's darken it. Like that. And let's put a shadow on the shirt underneath this arm, like that. A couple little squiggles here, there, makes it look like he's inside the canoe and his clothes are casting a shadow on his body. I'm going to give him a little shadow under his jaw here. And I may even put a little dark shadow line on the edge of the paddle. And then you can come back and darken the line here. And I think we need to maybe make this hat look like it's made of wool. So some lines, some lines will make it look like it's made of wool. Hmm. I feel like the picture is missing something. Maybe a little bit of a background? Sure, why not? How about a shoreline with a tree on it? Back on this side. If my character is moving through the picture from this side to that side, I like to give them space to move into. So let's put the other stuff in the picture behind the character. Here's the water in the distance, and here's the shoreline with some rocks on it, and some trees. These are what I call my squiggle trees. I think you're going to like how easy these are to draw. You start at the ground, and the tree grows up out of the ground towards the sky, and then it stops, and then we just dance back and forth from left to right, right to left going a little farther out each time and make it look kind of messy and irregular. That means it's not all exactly the same on either side. We're almost there. There's one tree. Pretty easy, huh? Let's do a small one in front of it. Right there. Okay, and I think we need to put a big cloud in the sky, a big soft looping cloud 
And I don't know about you, but I love drawing these little birds that look like flying letters of the alphabet. I wonder what letter that would be. Anyhow, that's a simple way, relatively speaking, to draw a picture of a voyageur paddling his canoe in the water. And you can add all the detail you want. I sometimes make reflections in the water like this. And you can make your shore a little darker in the background to set it back. Don't be afraid to outline some of the elements of your drawing now. And if you really wanted to, you could even color this. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you didn't find it too frustrating. Give it a try. I'd be really interested to see what you can do. Thanks. So, after all that, our challenge for you, create something every day. You could bake something. You could draw something. You could sew something. Uh, you could write a poem. You could make a list. You could dress up your dog in some kind of goofy costume. Oh, well, that I'd like to see. <laughs> well, we have an ancient wiener dog here, and uh, I don't think he'd be too happy. I don't think he would either, but maybe yours costume. would. But the yes. idea is to make something, something, do something creative every day of your life. I kind of think it's what I was meant to do, and I think some of you would agree. Yes, and laugh. Laugh a lot. Laughing is good. Yes. Take care. Bye-bye.